Nee, geht schon, ich mach das. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here, despite the fact that the keynote might run a bit out of time. So, yeah, thank you for being here. And um, we are here from uh, Deutsche Telekom T Systems talking today about image build as a service. So, why does it make sense to, to build your own images? Um, and before we start, um, a few words about ourselves, what, who we are. So hi, welcome everybody. My name is Daniela Ebert. Uh, I work for T-Systems um, since 2003 in different areas. Um, worked as an AIX engineer before, now focusing on, on Linux and, and building um, images. And yeah, I joined the Open Telecom Cloud team two years ago. And um, yeah, I'm now totally focused on, on our OpenStack uh, cloud and building the images on them. Welcome. My name is Kurt Galov. I got a bit of a history in the open source world. Been doing Linux for some time. Started as a kernel engineer. Um, working with SUSE for many years. Um, yeah, did some, some engineering and engineering leadership there. Um, OpenStack is something I've been doing since 2011. Um, 2012 in San Francisco was my first summit. And for some reason, Lauren put me up on stage for a keynote, which <laughs> kind of was intimidating at the time. Um, but it's, it's been growing since then significantly still, so it's, it's great to be part of this community. Um, I run the architects and uh, community team inside the Open Telecom Cloud project, and I'll, I was a bit involved in the image factory as well, so I'll, I'll talk some bit. Yes, my name is uh, Sebastian Wenner. I'm also architect for the Open Telecom Cloud, um, doing open source since we are about 2000, um, and focusing also on cloud technologies since the last, yeah, around about five years, um, helping T-Systems, building up Open Telecom Cloud, and also being part here of the, the Image Factory team. Good. What are we talking about today? So, yeah, intro, why are we doing it? What are our requirements? So why did we build up this whole thing? Um, how does the setup look like? So how are all these little gears fitting into each other and then doing their work? Um, what is the workflow from a requirement to have an image uh, available on our cloud? Um, and also doing an outlook um, where we want to be um, end of this year, next year. <coughs> What's up? So what do we want to do? Yes, some um, introductions. So giving you a bit of context what we are doing and, and why we are doing uh, public cloud. So um, Deutsche Telekom might not be the, the most, or even T-Systems might not be the, the most famous um, uh, public cloud company. Um, but if you look at uh, our portfolio, what we are doing with private cloud, with hybrid cloud, uh, public cloud was the, the missing piece uh, to our portfolio, what we wanted to offer. Um, so doing that in Germany under German legislation, following German data protection laws, um, I think we are able to fill in a gap, and um, we heard it in the keynote that compliance is really a big thing that you need to, to worry about. So having a, a secure cloud where you can run your workloads uh, is a very important uh, topic that we, we are focusing on. Simple, of course, I mean, you all know OpenStack, so uh, despite other solutions that are out there in the market, I think we, we rather build a, a simple and easy to use solution. Affordable, we, we are even running below Amazon price-wise, um, so making also public cloud affordable and open with all the APIs, what is around there to ease the use of, of our solution. And all that we, we are offering to the market as, as Open Telecom Cloud. And don't worry too much, it's only one more slide uh, about marketing and then we, we do a dive into the, the technical stuff, what you're in, uh, interested about, so just giving a bit of context. As said, um, it's really making a secure cloud um, where you can trust no third party access, uh, administrative access to it. It's all run out of Europe. Um, with all the, the privacy laws that are protecting your data running on it. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's it. Reasons, why are we doing it? Um, yeah, maybe one last sentence. We, we discovered that there are only three types of, of cloud images that you can offer. 
either they are too small, they are too big, or they do not fit. So and that is what we, we found from the vendors. And, and that's the starting point why we built this, this whole thing, our image factory. And, and Kurt is explaining some more details. What are the reasons? OK, so <clears throat> let, let me give you a few more detailed reasons why we actually took the decision to produce our own public images. Um, first is one of the, the key messages we do have is this security story. We need to offer secure cloud. And then obviously in an IAS model, the, um, the virtual machines, they belong to our customers. We don't touch them. But what we do want to do, we wanted to help our customers to create secure virtual machines. And actually our security folks, Deutsche Telekom has pretty impressive security um, folks. They can stop and kill projects and uh, put very high requirements uh, that make projects never go to market. Um, we were actually working with them and they came to us and said, well, please, please use what we learned from other platforms and pre-configure those images to be very secure and to be hardened. Uh, and we actually took the input, um, obviously wanted to be also friends with our security folks. Um, and included the, the learnings they had from how to harden images. Then, of course, that's half of the story. The other most important piece probably for secure public images to make sure um, the way you build them, you have transparency. You know exactly what's in there. Um, there's nothing in there that you don't have the RPM of, that you don't have the sources of. So we use a process that's transparent. All the input that goes into an image is published. So we have this image factory website where we do not only publish the, the QCAR2 files, but also all the, the profiles that govern the build process uh, and the scripts that go to do that. Um, so you can actually reproduce them, rebuild them. Uh, so this, this adds to transparency. And then last not least, um, a lot of our customers, um, well, either way they want to st uh, stay secure. Either they redeploy new images constantly um, because that's the way they manage their um, platform, the application, um, then they can just take the latest image and we provide updated image um, every other week. Uh, so you can have uh, all the latest patches without having to manually reinstall all, the, all those patches. At the same time, you also have the package mirrors uh, that have all the updates uh, mirrored in our environment. So you can also just do um, a patch update if that's what you prefer. So we, we kind of uh, support both models. Second group of reasons uh, we decided we need our own images uh, was the fact that there are specific things we need to do on the driver side. Um, we're sitting on an unusual, I should say these days, hypervisor. <laughs> um, most of the world has moved to uh, KVM. Um, we are using Xen. That will change in the future at some point in time. We'll open up to another hypervisor as well. Um, but currently still most is running on Xen. And there were some images that did not come with the right drivers. So we also had to have the ability to inject the drivers. So we did a bit of work to do build uh, RPMs that encapsulate those drivers in a clean way. So upgrades don't break them um, and included them into the images. And then later on, we also had special, special flavors that have um, high performance networking gear that need special drivers as well. So we then, of course, we used the capability to inject the drivers that are needed to take those uh, performance benefits that those bring. <clears throat> um, third point on the, the kind of platform support side is we also have a monitoring tool. Um, some of the um, data that you want to use uh, when you do monitoring, you can best collect from inside the image. Um, obviously, CPU, CPU utilization, you can easily measure from the outside. The hypervisor has all of that information. But for example, if you want to know if your file system runs full, that's something that the hypervisor um, should not care about and should not know. Uh, so we have this agent that the customer can easily enable and get the monitoring on that. And then finally, there's a number of things we did to pre-configure those images. Um, we want them to have the same experience, whether you use uh, CentOS or Oracle Linux or Red Hat or Fedora or OpenSUSE or Slash. And we wanted to make sure those images behave the same way. 
So they all, when they come up, they all find uh, their NTP server. <laughs> they all uh, find the DNS resolution. Well, DNS we do by, by DHCP. Um, anyway, um, but at least NTP we, we, pre we pre-configured in the images. Um, we have the same username uh, and the same way you can access the, the, the image via an SSH uh, key that's injected by uh, the cloud in the standard cloud in mechanism. Cloud in pre-configuration obviously is also part of this. So that's that's kind of the the reasons. Um, uh, and those reasons drove the requirements. I guess I covered most of them already. Um, those images, of course, we needed to make sure they are supportable, maintainable. Uh, they, are, they, they are secure and stay secure. So we have uh, the security hardening and the um, security updates uh, applied to them all the time. Also, one of the things, obviously, that we do when building the images, we, we make sure that all of the packages we inject to build the images uh, are integrity checked. So we check the RPM signatures. And we have a list of keys that we trust that come from the operating system vendors. And the one repository that we have in the open build service, where we build those few custom packages that we need. And then uh, one of the things we do is um, um, Coming from an enterprise company, there were actually some images available from other departments. Um, when we looked at them, we, we just said, well, those are not cloud images. They were gigabytes in size, and that's not what I expect from a cloud Im image. I expect those to be small, to come up very fast, and in a customer to be able to inject whatever is needed in addition to that wire cloud in it. Uh, that's the way we, our vision of how to use cloud images looks like. So we have built like small images. Um, where you can easily then just inject all the configuration and software that you need. Um, transparency I talked about. Um, and then um, one of the things uh, we delivered in the second step um, is that we actually put a significant effort in a test suite. So all those images after the build process uh, has run through, um, they get booted in a secure environment and then a number of tests are run against them and uh, this way we ensure um, if we do changes to our JIT tree where we keep the configuration of the images we don't screw up. So the image build happens constantly and then um, every morning I look at those test reports and see if something has gone wrong and then if some alarms pop up and we need to kind of look at whether we have screwed up or whether something's wrong with the, the build system or the test system. Um, and then yes of course we publish them um, by um, putting them on the, on the website, the Image Factory website, uh, with GPG signature, so you can also make sure it is the one we built and we test it. Um, let's talk a bit how the setup looks like and how we're doing it, and I'll hand yeah. over to Daniela. Thank you, Kurt. So before we started, we, we had a look at uh, the tools which are around, and um, yes, we first decided uh, to, to use the OpenStack a Kiwi tool um, yeah, which helped us to, to build the, uh, the cloud-based images. This, this tool simply um, yeah, pulls packages from the repositories and installs them in a change root environment. Um, first of all, this was just sufficient for, suffi sufficient for us because it built OpenSUSE, Slash, CentOS, um, Oracle, Linux, Red Hat, um, but in the second step, when we wanted to build Debian images, we um, decided to go for a second tool, which is Disk Image Builder. Um, so we use these tools in, in the same way. It's just like that one tool will not help us to build all the images. But as we have a setup which is quite modular, um, it works perfectly together and we are using the same environment, we are using the same scripts um, to and just leverage the tools. Um, besides these built tools, um, we also have some tools around, of course, all the um, template files, all the scripts are in a local JIT repository. Um, we have an automation, which is basically best scripts um, who trigger the, the workflow. And um, we use OpenStack tools like plans to register the images and have an Apache at the end who publishes our results and who shows what, what we have. So now, now I come to um, our build architecture. Um, we decided to set up um, our 
image build factory in a normal tenant on our public cloud it means we are not just somewhere in the back end doing some secret stuff um, we are a customer on our own cloud which is um, quite good because we see some problems earlier than our customers now which really really helps um, so what we have is a, we have a jump host um, how, where we can access the, the whole environment um, and w we have a web server publishing our results. These are the ones being public available. Um, the jump host is also an, an SNOT instance doing all the, the outgoing traffic. So the other ones like our build hosts and our um, data hosts and uh, are not public accessible and they do not have any public IPs. Mm. We have several Kiwi and disk image build hosts uh, just to spread the load. And um, yeah, they are talking to internal repository servers. We have mirrors like in um, SUSE SMT or in Red Hat Enterprise Update Infrastructure or some app caches. So this is um, also for our customers, but we are also using this um, to get the packages to build the, the images. After the images are built, um, we upload them to our object storage in the cloud, and we also have um, a connection to, to the cloud server um, to register them. Ah, okay. And So let's let's have a look how, um, how how we built the images or how, how the workflow is. So as, as stated before, we um, we have a JIT repository. Hmm? Yeah, okay. So we, we have a JIT repository which which holds our template files. Um, there we also have um, a keys to, to to sign the the images later, and. Um, yeah, we, another input are the RPMs from, um, from the reposit repository servers I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is what goes in Kiwi or what goes into Disk Image Builder. Um, and yeah, they are basically building the images and we're doing some fancy stuff around like collecting log files and assigning them and um, yeah, writing the, the log files somewhere, um, saving the previous results, um, so things like that. Um, after the, the image is built, um, the next step is to, to upload the image and register it. We um, have a, a two-step approach. We upload it to our object storage first and then register it as a private image. So these steps are everything what every customer could do. As I stated, we are a customer on our own cloud. Um, if this was successful, um, there is an automated test suite. This is um, yeah, booting a VM and, and starting a, a bunch of scripts um, to check whether um, the image, first of all, is bootable if it is accessible via SSH, if um, several configurations are done, if all the drivers are in. So basically SSH scripts checking um, the configuration and uh, if, if the image is well. Um, yeah, if the test was successful, the, um, the result is being published on, on our web server as QCOW2 files, so they are public available. Let's say that's our pushback to the community, so if you like, we'll see some links later. Um, and yeah, we also have, have scripts to, to register that in clans then. So that's, that's basically all. Um, I was thinking about bringing a demo, but I think that would be quite boring, seeing a script running 40 minutes um, and then it just a QCOW2 file. So um, I just brought some screenshots um, to, where's my mouse? Yeah, that uh, there, okay. Um, how, how it looks like, just to give you an, 
brief overview, yeah, what it is, how it feels, how it looks like. Um, so the the input is um, yeah just a simple um, XML file. So that that's a Kiwi XML file the, describing. Um, yeah, what, what you like to get, what kind of image you like to get, what drivers, oh, where's the mouse again? Um, there. Here, what, what drivers you like to have, um, what, what packages to include, what additional software, Python clients um, you like to have in your image. And so this, this goes into Kiwi. Then we, we start a script which yeah, simply calls Kiwi, and you see here that's that's Kiwi output. Yeah, that's not programmed by our own. It gets the repositories, uh, so the uh, so the channels, and sets up the change root environment. So that's not very exciting um, unless you have an error. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope we do not know. Um, and. Yeah, some, some more Kiwi output is that there is a conversion to QCOW2 and uh, then you hopefully get the, the success result um, and, and a log file where you can get even more details on which RPMs are in. Um, I think Kurt has mentioned it uh, already, we also store these results on the web server so it's, uh, you can see what's in and how the build process was done. That's all in the log files on the web server as well. So you know what you get. Um, this is now oops, not Kiwi anymore, so this, this is um, of our own, own stuff, our own automation. Um, it, it simply is an upload to the OBS and a client's register. Um, and as we see here, this was successful, so um, we, we can go on to, to the next thing. Um, so that, that's a whole flow, so because the last one was successful, we see here, here a, a nice output of, of the checks we do. Um, these checks were, we started I think with five or six and then we discovered uh, some errors with um, the cloud init configuration and the data sources and some interface issues. And so this, this test suite grow and grow depending on what kind of errors we saw. And um, yeah, at the moment we have 30, 40 test cases and they are growing uh, e even more. Yeah. And if this um, test is successful, then we are going to um, yeah, we are going to publish um, it um, at the website and also at the client server. Maybe also interesting, we do some update tests and we do reboot tests just to make, uh, to make sure that, that, that really everything works fine. Yeah, we started, um, as I stated, with, with Kiwi and um, the, the, the primary motivation was to have um, images for our launch at, at CB2016 and there we decided to, to go with the most common images. So we're building OpenSUSE, um, Slash, CentOS, Oracle Linux, um, and I think that was it for the first step. And then the second step, we went for Red Hat, Debian, and Fedora. Um, so we do that regularly. Um, and the only image we are currently not building, but is um, in our cloud, is the uh, Ubuntu image. It is provided by Canonical, where due to some restrictions, not, not allowed to, to build it by our own and uh, Canonical um, yeah, provides them to us and any changes need to be aligned with them. Yeah. Oh, that's just a different view. So um, after we've published them, that's just um, 
a screenshot of our dashboard where you can see um, in the public image um, tab what, what kind of images we have here, the OpenSUSE, the Debian, the Fedora. Um, and yeah, we usually publish them every four weeks um, unless there is some high security reason to do it. We would be able to do it daily, but um, yeah, four weeks is, is the regular publish. So last but not least, well, we would like to give you an outlook because this is what we currently have, but we're from our point of view not at the end and we want to improve and um, want to bring new things in, in, into our image factory and I think that's good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let me uh, share some ideas that we have um, how to, to further improve this and make this uh, more useful for our customers but maybe also to to other cloud providers. Um, actually, we know about one cloud provider who is uh, using our images as well. So um, we've had the first success in that already sharing. This image factory is live now for more than a year. I mean, we used it for, for the launch uh, 2016 in March. Um, there's a bit of technical depth that we have collected. I mean, we, we did not have a lot of time to design this when we did it initially. Um, so if you looked at the infrastructure, there's an NF NFS server in there, which I don't like. Um, there's also some long-running VMs in there, which I would rather create on the fly and have them short-running. And then um, one of the ideas that we do have is uh, we have some customers, they come to us and ask, well, we want to have a specific image with those specific configurations and those specific packages um, pre-configured. And I mean, our standard answer is, yeah, well, just use Cloud and inject them at boot time and that's fine. But um, for some of them, it's not enough. Um, so one of the things we're thinking is, Okay, we could also offer Image Factory as a service, allow customers to kind of um, have their custom images built by our Image Factory. And uh, when I say built, then it's the same methodology. It's not just uh, you do them once in some manual fashion, but you have the profiles in place and build them nightly and have the updated version every morning, if you like. Um, and that, that's what we do with our public images currently. Even if you only publish them every couple of weeks, um, I mean, we, we, could we could publish them every night if you like to. Um, so if we go down that route, uh, some of this uh, infrastructure would need to be improved specifically for security reasons because currently um, we have an engineering team that fully controls what goes into those images, what keys are trusts, what software runs in there. Um, obviously, if, if we allow customers to inject configuration, things we don't necessarily trust, we need to isolate the built environment more than we currently do. So that's another improvement we would need to do. Um, then, of course, there's um, additional images with additional content we're currently discussing. Um, having this mechanism in place, um, we can easily um, increase the number of images without adding too much load to our engineering team. Um, one other thing we're doing is um, we have built up in our test department um, some more infrastructure to run test jobs via Jenkins. We're currently not using that. We're just having simple bash scripts. So at some point in time, we want to use the infrastructure and put it all under a common uh, pane of glass. Uh, so you have the kind of visibility from the Jenkins dashboard for all of them. Um, I guess that's some of the improvement I had in mind. You have, you have some more, I guess. Yeah, I can tell a bit more about the, the Windows integration. So. Um, Last summit in, in Barcelona, we had some great talks to the cloud base in it folks. Where's um, Peter? Hmm? <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> Not here. Um, so about their work that they are doing on the Windows side, and some of our Windows engineers also picking up that work and, and doing a Windows integration. So by now we have a also automated Windows build, which is standalone. So it's not yet integrated into our overall Windows uh, or in image factory framework, but it's more in an, an island um, that is producing our Windows images. It's also automated by now, but it lacks the, the overall framework support that we can offer in the image factory. So that will be one of the next steps to move also the, the Windows factory, which is currently building only server images, so 2012, 2016. And I think we are even doing 2008, but um, 
uh, not something I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so that needs to be moved into the, the overall framework that we, we, we want to have there. Um, also, thinking ahead, um, as you saw also in the keynotes, Kubernetes and, and Dockerized images uh, is really picking up speed and, and getting more and more um, demand and, and, and weight in your daily work. So not only building images for, for infrastructure as a service, but also for container frameworks so that we have uh, uh, Docker images for whatever application that we want to offer um, will be one of the, the next projects uh, that we are looking forward to, to integrate into the image factory. Something I missed? No, but maybe adding to that, I mean, um, this effort has been mostly driven out of systems engineering so far, using lots of open source tools, obviously. But uh, one of the things we're obviously looking forward to is um, talking to, to the community, talking to you guys. Uh, we would be very happy if people want to join this effort and maybe see, well, um, can, uh, can we contribute to this? Um, is this something that could be used also for images outside of our own cloud? I, I mean, I told we know this one cloud that's already using our images. Um, we are very open to, to collaborate with others and making this more open and others to, to reuse some of that work and build on top of that and, and make this project even, even stronger. Mm. Good. I guess that's it. I think that's it, yeah. Yeah. Questions? Any questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll just repeat the question for, for the benefit of everybody. The question was how we deal with old images, how do we version them, how we kind of um, deprecate, deprecate old, old versions, right? Um, so there's, there's two sorts of images we publish. We have uh, ones where we attach a, a date stamp, um, and those we currently uh, keep rather long. Um, so uh, we have not yet deleted one of them. That means uh, if you build and use one of those images, you can rely on that still being available in a year from now. And we're doing that be because we have customers that want that. Uh, that's also the reason why we don't publish uh, daily, but publish only every, every four weeks or so, uh, because otherwise that list would, would grow too much. Um, over the long term, we kind of need a strategy to um, maybe don't delete them, uh, but hide them from customers to not confuse them. Um, so customers that have a reference to them can still use those old images. Um, after some point, we may want to have a discussion with those customers whether they are sure they still want to use the very old things and still have that in a secure way. But um, in general, we would storage is cheap. That's not the real issue. The issue is confusing customers with huge lists. Uh, the other kind of uh, thing we do is we have one latest image all the time. And that one actually is sometimes also do a lot more often than every four weeks. And that is, that is a moving target. So you can always reference the latest image. Uh, you can rely on that. It's a tested, uh, well-working image. Um, but that, that's then between, um, well, an hour and uh, maybe Days. a few weeks old. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's the, way, the way we currently do it. Uh, we're looking forward to this um, community visibility blueprint being implemented. It would help us with uh, hiding images without deleting them. There's a blueprint in the, in the glance. Uh, area that's being discussed now for years. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um. So the, the question was, um, he's, he's doing the same thing, having latest images, but when you re-register them, they get a new ID, and that kind of screws the users. Um, and the question is whether we have the same issue. Yeah. You want to answer? Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> we, we do have that same yeah. issue. So in, in the um, docs, we basically tell customers, if you want to use that latest image, don't reference it by ID, reference it by name. And that's the best we have come up with so far. Yeah. Um, if, if you have some ideas about a better solution, we'd be happy to learn. There was one more question over there. Yeah. 
Um, the question, just to repeat, uh, was about the, the Windows build, which is not yet integrated into the uh, image factory and how to manage the, the licensing issue. Did I capture that? Um, yes. Um, so licensing, especially for the Windows stuff, is always um, yeah, not a very nice thing that you have to do. Um, so the, the Windows images that we are offering on the cloud is, is fully licensed. So we, in, in our charging data records, we, we are collecting the usage of, of Windows images. And also, as we are running just as a normal customer on our own cloud, also the, the Windows images that we are producing, the, the usage is counted and reported, and, and we have to pay it on our own. So it's, yeah. Uh, Windows or Microsoft does not yet offer a perfect solution how to, to do all the licensing stuff on the cloud. And recently, with uh, 2016, they also changed again metrics, what is measured and then how to do it. So yeah, we are measuring and, and paying it. There's no easier way to, to handle it at the moment. Just we are the uh, charging records that we are collecting. Yeah. Maybe one additional comment to that. So the, what we did originally, all the images, if you boot them in the per instance price per hour, the uh, license fees that you pay to, to Microsoft uh, or some of the enterprise Windows, uh, sorry, enterprise Linux oh. vendors is included. We have recently opened up a model where a customer can declare, okay, yeah. I come with a licensed uh, version. I do my own license management and then he can declare towards us, uh, please don't charge for that, and we, we support it with the same images and do some, some vendor data magic to, to kind of make that secure. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for Windows, there are some, some PowerShell scripts deciding if it is a bring your own license VM, then register, do not register at our KMS, and if it is um, yeah, one of ours, then it will be registered there. So this is mainly handled by, by PowerShell scripts and uh, looking at the metadata. It's, it's Windows on board yeah, utility. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, what, what tools are we using to, to build the uh, Windows images? So, um, of course, it's not Kiwi and it's not Disk Image Builder. Um, it's the, the onboard Windows tools that we are using. And the, the, as I said, the cloud based folks, um, they have on GitHub, they have some, some reference implementation how to use the, the Windows onboard tools to, to generate images and also to. Uh, I think they can even create some QCOW images there. Um, so that is being orchestrated in, in a meaningful fashion that at the end we also end up with some uh, Windows images. So it's, it's the, the cloud-based stuff for the, the cloud-based init, replacing cloud init, and uh, Windows tools to, to make the build. <clears throat> there was another question. Okay, so the, the question was why we chose those two tools uh, and specifically um, what would be specific reasons uh, that uh, Kiwi maybe has features uh, that could be added to Disk Image Builder. Um, so we would only need one. Yeah. <laughs> Does that, um, yeah. Um, actually, we started with Kiwi um, and the reason was uh, when we started, we had some images that came out of a different uh, department. They had used the, the nice SUSE, what was there? Um, uh, oh, yeah. Um, what was the tool? Studio. Studio, Studio. Studio to actually build that. So what that project did is it was using Kiwi to build images and he had a nice web interface to, to do the configuration. Um, that was one of the starting points for this. Um, so that was more, more or less a historic, not a technical reason to start with Kiwi. Yeah. Um, later on, when we then uh, did a bit more research and uh, kind of took, took a deliberate decision, we left it in place because on the SUSE side, um, actually Kiwi works uh, better um, than Disk Image Builder does. So what we would need from Disk Image Builder is somewhat stronger support for, for OpenSUSE and SLES um, in order to drop that. To be very open, currently it's not a pain for us to use those two different tools. So it's not something that, uh, that we are actively looking to get rid of. Um, both tools work fine. Yeah. Mm. 
So mm -hmm. the question was whether yeah, okay. um, we are able to deploy core Windows images using cloud-based tools and not just the, what was the other one? Yeah. yeah. So at the moment, we are also doing just the, the standard one, the, the, the full-blown one, not the, the core one. And I have to admit, we are three Linux guys here, so we are not the deep window, uh, Windows experts. Um, so if you are interested, I, we can just make contact, and I would hand that over to, to our Windows folks. Okay. All right, maybe a last question if the if you're allowed to take it. Links? Yes, I think we have yeah. you under the last page. Maybe you've just flipped. Thank you for that. We just have <laughs> <one> <laughs> to. That, that's the last page uh, for, for today. Um, here you find links um, to, to our image factory on, on the one hand, where we have um, published um, some documentation, but also you can find the images and the log files there. Um, we also blocked on our telecom blog uh, about what we've done there. So you get an introduction, you get also some deep insights what, um, what kind of modifications we've done to the images. So if you don't want to, to read the, the, the scripts um, in, in the uh, folders. And we also have a help, more or less a general help center on how to handle images on our cloud. So, yeah, I hope that helps and hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. And have a great summit. Yeah.